technology courses that we help every summer or so with St. Pete College. Um, and that's Michelle Osovitz. They're leaning in the front. Um, and she brings her class over in the summers for guest lectures and lab uh, exercises. And Lexi um, has also participated in OCG pretty much every summer. Um, and that's her with some of the students that were there presenting. And you know, she's participated in all kinds of outreach as well. I just don't have photos for them. But she's always kept very busy. <laughs> this is probably the highlight of all of our lives that we met uh, a very famous uh, science writer who writes for the Atlantic and National Geographic, Ed Young. And uh, this is our selfie with him. And, <laughs> and I actually flagged him down yes, to get the selfie. The only person that had the, the you know what, actually <laughs> asked permission or, or asked if he would take a selfie with Lexi. So I appreciate that very much. Um, <laughs> we are often kind of silly together. And over the last few years, Lexi has uh, co-authored seven abstracts that I'm aware of and presented at least three times, not counting the number of times she's presented here for grad students. Um, Lexi has worked really hard in the last couple of years, and what you're going to see today proves it. Um, and I'm very proud of who stands before us today and how far she's come. So I, without further ado, I'll introduce Lexi, had before. It's been my pleasure to be her co-advisor. Sorry, <laughs> switch and screen. Thank you everybody for coming out to listen to my uh, master's thesis research that I've been spending my last three years on. And what I've been studying is single stranded DNA phage related to microviridae within the Siona robusta gut. And in order to put this research into context, first we need to discuss a holobiont. And a holobiont is a host in all of its symbionts. And these symbionts can be permanent or in constant association with their host, or they can be transient, so they can come and go. They can, go, they can vary from viruses, bacteria, and fungi. And then when we talk about bacteria in relation to a host, we refer to that as a microbiome. And then when we talk about viruses in association with a host, we talk about a virome. So with that, these symbionts can form complex relationships with their host, often benefiting them. And when we talk about a gut system, it's been identified that there can be 10 to 30 trillion bacteria in association with the gut alone. So we have a whole bunch of microbes living within us, and they are vital members of our gut ecosystem. So they are now being referred to as their own organ because of the impact they have on their host. When we look at those microbes, they can assist with energy utilization, and this goes as well with digestion and absorption of nutrients. But disruptions in this ecosystem can cause problems. So we've all taken antibiotics, they've upset our stomach, and this is a disruption in your gut microbiota. Modifications to this microbiome also have large impacts. So if you completely change it, it can be linked to diseases such as fatty liver disease, <laughs> fatty liver disease, obesity. But what controls these microbes. So your first thought might be that it is your immune system. And your immune system does have an impact on the microbes in your gut. But one thing that is often overlooked are bacteriophages. And these are viruses that specifically infect bacteria. And they have, they're often referred to as phages, and this is how I'll be referring to them for the rest of this talk. But they have a large control on this ecosystem. So they can shape your microbial communities gut. And all of these interactions are really complicated. And if you throw in the fact that higher taxa have an adaptive and an innate immune system, these lines get very blurred very quickly. So we need to look at all of these dynamics, but in a simpler system, which is why I study Siona robusta. And this is a marine sessile invertebrate. So it is pretty much just attached to a rock its whole life, and it filters water from the water column in the ocean. They're often referred to as just a sac of intestines on a rock because one of their large components is their, their gut. So it makes it really good when studying these simple gut interactions between bacteria and viruses. This is a simple rendering of a Siona. And it, to put it in perspective, it's about the size of my hand as a large adult, so they're not large. But they are filter feeders. So when they sit on that rock, 
They come into contact with microorganisms within the water column, and these can range from phytoplankton, viruses, and microbes. And they bring water in through their in-siphon, and then it goes out through their ex-siphon. These microorganisms will get concentrated in their brachial basket and then processed through their gut. Their gut is compartmentalized, like seen in higher chordates, and is composed of a stomach, a midgut, and a hindgut. These organisms are also urochordates, so they're one notch lower than chordates on the phylogenetic tree, and are close to fish and mammals in the family vibrata. They have a rapid developmental cycle, and we know this because they're a well-studied developmental model, so we can use the fact that they're broadcast spawners to our advantage. So we can take a little bit of sperm, a little bit of egg, mix them together, put them on a petri dish, and we can have hundreds of animals just on one dish. And within, after we plate them, within five days, they actually can open their siphons and begin feeding. So this creates ease when doing manipulation experiments. So we can take the bacteria, feed one bacteria or a bacteria and its host, or, or bacteria and its phage, excuse me, and then study these dynamics in the gut model. They also maintain a core microbiome. And we know this because we've studied animals that come from two, three different places on this planet for over a three year time. And they're found in three different bodies of water in three different locations. So the first one is Naples, Italy in the Mediterranean. The second is Woods Hole, Massachusetts in the Atlantic and then San Diego, California in the Pacific. And through this study, they were able to identify that regardless of where they're found over three years, there were always 35 microbes that are found in association with these animals. So this could be a core microbiome that has contributions to their overall host function. Since we identified the microbes, we wanted to see what viruses could be present in the system because we know the phages have a large impact on the bacteria in association with a host. So we studied animals from San Diego, California, and looking into their virome, we identified that it was teeming with double-stranded DNA viruses dominated by phage. But looking through this virome, we noticed that there was presence of these, <coughs> this study was done by Lay and colleagues, we noticed that there were single-stranded DNA phage in, a, in high quantities within this system. And this is a group of phage that is often overlooked, so they are identified in a variety of metagenomic studies, but it's often that they're just identified and their diversity is not looked into. So this is where I come in, where I looked at the single stranded DNA diversity of <coughs> microviridae. So first, to get a little bit of a bearing, we talk about taxonomy. So within microviridae, there are accepted subfamilies. And these are accepted by the ICTV, which is the International Committee on Taxonomy of Viruses. And they break this family into two subfamilies, Bolivirinae and Gacushavirinae. The genome range from these is about 4.4 to 6.1 kilobases. And they keep their genome in a circle, circular orientation. And just to put that in a little bit of context, T4, which is a well-characterized phage for E. coli, has a genome of about 63 kilobases that can encode up to 300 different proteins. This family has 4.4 to 6.1 kilobases and can have as little as three genes on its genome. So there are differences between these two subfamilies. Bolivirinae has been largely classified in association with E. coli, and then Gacushavirinae has been identified to infect intercellular obligate parasites. There's not just differences in what they infect, there's differences in their protein structure, so the capsid that makes up their virus. And with Bolivirinae, there is the protein D, which is the external scaffolding protein, and then protein G, which is a major spike protein. And this major spike protein has been thought to be associated with host recognition and attachment. And there's not seen a genes, or genes of similar function in the Gacushavirinae. But with the morphological differences, where do we find these? And we actually can find them everywhere. So they've been identified in studies looking at feces from humans and from animals, in dragonflies, in freshwater ecosystems, saltwater ecosystems, and then even methane seeps at the bottom of the ocean. And with this increase of characterization in different environments, we've seen an increase in classification. So this taxonomy has expanded with proposed subfamilies. And these come from the literature. When researchers identify sequences that are similar to the family microviridae, but do not group with either one of the accepted subfamilies, they break them into these seven proposed subfamilies. 
And when looking at the differences between all of them, we notice that they have things in common. But the difference we notice is that it's in the gene organization. So it's not just what genes they have in their genome, it's where they keep them in relation to one another. But because this is a circle and it's hard to analyze it because there is no stop or start in a circle, we can actually cut it and lay it out in a linear fashion and this creates ease when comparing them to one another. So here are some identified genomes from, obviously we're gonna go through them, but from subfamily members and the, some of the things that they have in common are this major capsid protein. And this is a conserved protein among the subfamilies, but it's not conserved enough that there aren't differences. So there are subtle differences between all these different proteins. And this is actually how we classify them phylogenetically. So when we break them up into subfamilies, we refer to this major capsid protein. They also share a DNA pilot protein, an internal scaffolding protein, a replication initiator protein, and then a DNA binding protein. And with all this knowledge in hand, I wanted to create objectives to tackle this in the Siona system. So my overarching objective is to characterize the diversity of complete circular genomes related to the single-stranded phage in the family Microviridae. Microviridae. And I broke this objective into four different questions. The first one is the, to identify the number of unique Microviridae genomes within the Siona gut. Then look at the different communities between the gut and the water. So since they are filter feeders and they're constantly coming into contact with all those microorganisms, we hypothesize that the community within the gut would be relatively similar to the water that they filter. We then, for question three, wanted to see if there was any compartmentalization, so broken up between that stomach, the midgut, and the hindgut, and see if there's any phage associated with just a single compartment. And then we wanted to see the diversity of microviridae within the Siona gut. So first, to do any of this, we needed to collect animals. So we got animals from San Diego in Mission Bay. And to characterize the phage in association with the water that they filter, we actually took one liter of water to process for phage genomes as well. These animals are then collected from the field and go to a holding tank in Carlsbad, where they are held for later shipment. So these animals are collected, put into this tank, and then because they're put into this water and they are filter feeders, we wanted to see if there was any phage associated with this water as well. So we took one liter of sample from this to classify for the phage. These animals are then shipped to us, so they go into the shipment overnight on a plane and we receive them in our laboratory. Once we get them in our lab, we pick 10 animals at random and five of those had their guts trisected. So again, in that stomach, the midgut, and the hindgut, and then we trisect them with full gut content. So this allows us to see if there's any phage that was associated with the food that they are eating. We then take the other five, oh, sorry. We then take the other five to clear for 24 hours. So they're put in virus-free water in a tank, changing water every two hours because they are constantly filtering and constantly defecating. So they will refilter their defecation. This way we can make sure that their gut is completely clear or rid of any food content. So with that, with the cleared guts, we're able to trisect them. There's a lag. Trisect them and get cleared guts. So this allows us to see if there's anything associated with a gut without food contents compared that to what would be associated with a gut full of food. Once we had our tissues in hand, they were put into a tube and then broken up to release any of the phage that could be associated with that mucosal gut line. These tissues were then pelleted because the tissue is heavy, it goes to the bottom of the tube, and viruses are relatively light, so they stay in that supernatant or the liquid that's left. We take that liquid and we filter it through a 0.22 micron filter and we get viral-like particles. These viral-like particles are then put through a cesium chloride gradient and the 1.2 to 1.5 gram per mil fraction is collected. And this is what we call our viral concentrant. We also wanted to see what was present in those water samples. So we took the liters that we collected and they were filtered through a 0.22 micron filter to get those viral-like particles. Then they were concentrated further on a 100 kilodalton amicon filter and then put through a cesium chloride gradient as well to further concentrate and purify. These viral concentrates were then amplified via rolling circle amplification and then we did whole genome analysis with aluminum MySeq sequencing. Once we get
have to do some preliminary bioinformatics before we can tell anything of what's going on. So we used the Cyverse platform, and we got the sequences back that we trimmed. Then we did some quality filtering, and we predicted viral sequences, and then put those into Metavir. And this is just a platform that we can use to, to help us identify which viruses are present. And then from Metavir, I was able to pull the 1.8 or 1 to 8 kilobase range for the circular contigs. And with this data in hand, I was able to tackle our first question. So what were the unique genomes present in the Siona system? And with all of those genomes that I had, I compared them against a microvirate database. So this had over 4,000 of those major capsid proteins because we wanted to see which of our sequences were similar to this family of phage. And I was able to identify 488 genomes. But this isn't it because some of these could be the same. So we wanted to do dereplication. So I used SDT, which is sequence demarcation tool. And I was allowed, or it, this allowed me the ability to look at the percent identity shared between all the genomes. So our cutoff was 95%. And if we had genomes that hit over 95% similar to one another, we deem that as the same. If they were underneath that 95%, they are unique. And from this process, we were able to identify 258 unique microvirate genomes within the Siona system. And I wasn't sure if this was a lot, if this was expected, or this was too few. So I needed to compare it to the literature. So I went in, did a lit review to see if I could see what studies had done looking at the microvirate within the gut community. And honestly, it was underwhelmed. So these. <laughs> So like I said before, single strand of DNA phage is often overlooked. So there is not a lot of characterization of the diversity within ecosystems, let alone a gut. I was able to find two studies in 2017 and 2018, the first one being on humans. So this looked at the feces of coronary heart disease patients, and this did not look for any association with the phage to a disease, but it just wanted to see what was present. And they did feces which is not an adequate picture of a virome, but it's the best that we can do because we can't really go around sampling human intestines and then breaking up looking for phage. We have to deal with the feces. So from the fecal content, they were only able to identify 14 microvirate genomes in association with the human gut. And now there's one study done from non-human animals, which is the termite. And this looked at termite gut, so they went in, did dissections, pulled out that whole gut, and they were able to identify 12 microvirate genomes in association, in association with the termite gut. And in our system, we had 258 unique microvirate genomes within an animal the size of my hand with a three inch gut. If we compare that to humans, a human gut is about 20 feet, and it has a larger girth. So they were only able to identify 14 microvirate from a human fecal sample when we had 258 from the animal the size of my hand. So with all of this excitement, I wanted to see if this community was similar to the water or if it was distinct from the water. So with this, I'll tackle my second question. And in order to do this, we did our methods of recruitment analysis. And I'm just going to walk you through a sample of data that I did so you guys can kind of get a feel of um, the data that I got and how I could process it. So first I started with all of those complete genomes and then I wanted to compare them to all of our viral samples. So the stomach cleared, midgut cleared, et cetera, had individual viral files is what we did because this is all on the computer, of course. And then on the left is an example of our phage. So this one phage would be compared against all these different gut compartments and the water samples. So with this, I was able to create presence absence data. And if you see phage one, we can see it's found in the stomach cleared, hindgut cleared, and then mission bay sample, or phage three, which is found in all the gut compartments. So since you guys have a few of what I did, I was able to do a cluster-based analysis using the Bray Curtis index. So I looked at the dissimilarity between these two systems. And you can see right away that the water is distinctly different from the gut community, which was really surprising. Since they're filter feeders constantly coming into contact with all the things in their water, they have a community that is different from where they get their food. 
but I wasn't satisfied, satisfied with just this. So I wanted to see what the water was composed of. And looking at the genomes, we identified two microviridae within the Mission Bay samples, and then 19 from Carlsbad, which is the holding tank water. So these 21 water sequences, I wanted to see if they were present within the Siona gut. So I compared it to all the full guts and all the cleared guts. And what you can see is every single water sequence we have is found in all of the guts. And when it comes to the holding tank, this is where we're not sure if these viruses or these phage come from the Siona or the water, because when they're put in this tank, they're left in it for up to eight hours. And while the, these animals are filtering and defecating, if our sampler comes in and picks the animals up and then samples the water, we're not necessarily surprised that we see that phage associated with the gut are also in the water column. So it's unclear if he sampled the water before or after the animals were removed or put in, but still every single water sequence is found. So with this, we wanted to see if there were different phage associated with the different gut compartments. So using the same analysis, I analyzed the communities that were hitting more similar to one another. So on the right is the stomach cleared, midgut cleared, and stomach full. And what we noticed is that the stomach cleared has the highest amount of unique genomes in association with it out of these three gut compartments. And it drops dramatically from the stomach cleared to the stomach full. So it goes from 71 to 6. But between the stomach cleared and the midgut cleared, it goes from 71 to 34 with 40 shared genomes. And then when we compare the ones that group more similar with the hindgut, so the hindgut full, the midgut, hindgut full, midgut full, and hindgut cleared, we see that the midgut maintains from 34 to 25, so it doesn't drop dramatically like we saw in the stomach, but the hindgut pretty much maintains. So it goes from 18 to 14, and then it's shared 11. And looking at this, I noticed that, interestingly enough, the hindgut groups together. So the hindgut cleared and the hindgut full group more similar to one another. The stomach full and the stomach cleared group similar to one another. But the midgut actually is separate. So the midgut clear is more similar to the stomach, and then the midgut full is more similar to the hindgut. Pretty interesting, and it allowed us to create the hypothesis that maybe that midgut is acting as a transitional zone for these phage because these numbers do not drop dramatically from clear to full compartments. So there could be something in the midgut that makes this an intermediate for these phage. So when looking at these compartments, we wanted to see all the cleared versus all the full. So I did an analysis putting all of the cleared gut compartments together. And we found that the stomach cleared has, the, again, the highest number of unique genomes. But as we go from the midgut to the hindgut, it actually drops. So the midgut has 32, and the hindgut only has 8. So we see a decrease of phage present in the gut compartments as you move through it. And this is actually a trend that we don't see in the full gut. So we have 19 genomes that are associated with the stomach full. The midgut has 23, which is the highest. And then the hindgut full has 20. So there's a max of four different phage within the gut compartments in a full gut. But though we see unique within each individual gut compartment, we see that there's a high overall shared. So the cleared guts have 85 shared genomes when the full guts have 62 shared. So though it seems that there are unique phage associated with each individual compartment, there is still a high amount of shared between them. So we can't say definitively that there's compartmentalization, but there's definitely something going on. So with this, we wanted to look at the diversity. So since we see how these are grouping, what subfamilies do we have within the Siona gut? So to do this, we need to do it on a genomic and a major capsid protein level. So first we took the genomes and we identified what genes were present. And again, because it's a circle and there is no start or end, we needed to pick a mock starting point to ease for analysis. So what we did is we picked the major capsid protein. So what we did is we put all the major capsid proteins at a single starting point. That way we can, pair, we can compare the organization of the genes to one another with greater ease. And with this, we wanted to look at the phylogeny. 
So I pulled out all of the Siona major capsid proteins and then compared them with reference major capsid proteins. And these are the reference ones that are identified from the subfamily members already known. So putting these together, I did an alignment and this allowed us to create a phylogenetic tree. So with this, we're gonna start with the organization. So this figure represents all of the known gene organizations on the left of the figure, and then all of the ones we see within the Siona genomes on the right side of the figure. And then all the way to the right, all these numbers represent the frequency that these organizations occurred in our genome. So how many times we see this. And Gakusha Verne has one of the highest, so we see from what is known on the organization, we see an increase in identified organizations within our Siona system. And most notably, this first one, CGM1, this organization occurred 156 times out of 258 of our genome. So it was a dominant organization of their genes. Secondly, we noticed that group D had an increase as well, so there's one identified organization for this subfamily, but we also see an increase in the organization from our sequences. We had the highest frequency at 10 for this organization, so we see an increase in what is known within this family of phage. We also noticed something unique with our sequences, so this is a new subfamily, which is actually being proposed as a sister clay to and largely due to the fact that it has this external scaffolding protein. So this is that protein that's associated with Bolivirinae that's not seen in any other subfamily except Petunovirus. So with this external scaffolding protein identified, we were able to identify one genome out of 258 that had this external scaffolding protein in it. So we wanted to see not just the organization, but what subfamilies we have. And I was able to create this beautiful phylogenetic tree that took hours of my life. So we're gonna go through it step by step. <laughs> so you don't need to focus on the words or anything. It's just how our Siona sequences fall in relation to what is known for this family. And I'm gonna walk you through the things that are important. So don't get overwhelmed. <laughs> but just to hit the bullet points, I added 258 Siona MCPs with 96 of those reference MC. But when I wanted to see, because everybody wants to identify something new, so I was really excited because potentially maybe we could have a new subfamily, I realized that these tox taxonomic boundaries between these subfamilies are really fluid. So since there's been such an increase in classification in the recent years, it's really difficult for a novice like me to come in and understand where these cle clean cut boundaries are especially because there necessarily aren't any. So once a researcher identifies something that's unique within its, um, within its genomes, they pretty much just block it off, give it a name, and that's it. So these have not gone through the ICTV, so they do not have strict boundaries on how we group them. So unfortunately, we didn't see anything unique <coughs> or anything novel as in a subfamily, but I did my best to interpret this figure. So first, it's important to see where our Siona sequences did not fall. We did not have any within the Bolivirinae subfamily or the, or the Stokovirinae subfamily. We had the highest amount of unique genomes fall within Gakusha virinae. So we had 188 Siona sequences that fell within this one specific subfamily. And on this figure, it's actually collapsed just because of how large it is. So I'm going to represent it separately, which is here. And again, I know, hours of my life, people. So <laughs> please don't focus on the words. This just shows us where a Siona sequences fall in relation to the reference. So I'm going to walk you through what's important. So again, we have 188 of those sequences with 34 reference major capsid proteins added in. And this is 72% of our Siona sequences fall within this specific subfamily. And looking into why this could potentially be, I noticed in all of the studies that are done, Gokusha virinae is has a high prevalence. So it's often referred to as a cosmopolitan phage. So it's identified in a lot of different studies in a lot of different environments. So I wasn't necessarily surprised that we had sequences group with it or necessarily a lot, 
but I did not expect 72% of what we had. And going through this, I noticed something specific. So we had so many sequences within these reference, or so many sequences within this tree, and only 30 reference genomes, and there's a large amount of our Siona sequences that don't move closely with any known reference, which is represented here. So all of these purple boxes indicate groups of Siona capsid proteins that don't show immediate grouping with a reference capsid protein that we added in. And poking into this a little bit further, I wanted to see what the possible percent differences between these capsid proteins were. So I put them all into that sequence demarcation tool and I was able to look at the percent identity between the Siona sequences within these boxes and any close reference sequence. So I was able to find that these blocks of Siona have less than 72% shared amino acid identity to any reference sequence. And this could be an addition of a large amount of novel phage from the specific subfamily from just one organ the size of my hand, one organism. So with the uptick in the Siona sequences, I also wanted to look at the microbiome. So we know that these infect intercellular obligate parasites, but can we see the bacteria within Siona associated with the microbiome? So with that, I looked into the Siona microbiome study done in 2014, and I was able to identify Gokusha virinae hosts down to a bacterial family level. So this can explain some of this, some of the sequences that we see within the subfamily, but it doesn't necessarily explain why we see 188 unique genomes. And it could be that Siona have novel bacterial hosts for this subfamily. Going back to this main tree, we noticed that the second highest amount of diversity we saw was in group D. And group D has seven identified reference genomes, and we had 33 of our Siona fall within the subfamily. So again, expanding on what is seen within these subfamilies. Their second highest was Picoviranae, and it has nine reference genomes, or nine reference MCPs, I'm sorry, and 19 of our Siona sequences fell within the subfamily. We then identified alpavirinae, and alpavirinae is largely associated with the human virome. So it has not been identified outside of human virome studies. So any environmental study that I can look into does not have alpavirinae group with it until now. So there are 18 reference genomes we added from the specific subfamily, and we had eight Siona sequences fall within this group that's only known association is with human viromes. Going into this a little bit further, being intrigued and being a scientist, I noticed that there were four of the Siona sequences that were only found in the hindgut full. So there's something that is an association with a full hindgut in the Siona that has these phage with it. And three of those four group in this clade that's a little bit different from any of the identified reference. So it does not group similar to anything that is known within this subfamily, so it's an introduction of some novel members of this group. We then had parabactroides prophage that has only two known references, and we had seven Sion sequences group within it. And then to that picanovirus. So that's the one with the external scaffolding protein, and it has five identified reference, and then we had two of those Siona sequences group within it. And because this subfamily or sister clade is a bit special with that external scaffolding protein, it probed me to deep a little bit further. And I found that these sequences come from the methane seep soil in Eel River Basin. And Eel River Basin is in Northern California. And our, our, our Siona come from Mission Bay, which is also in California. And not knowing much about the state, I looked up where these were in relation to one another because I wanted to see if they could potentially be close, which is why we see these within it, or how far they could be. So I actually saw that these two locations are seven, over 700 miles apart from one another. And I know in the grand scheme of the planet that 700 miles is not a lot, but we were not able to identify any of the picanial virus sequences within our water column. So there's something going on between the soil of the methane seep in the Eel River Basin and something similar in our Siona gut 
with these two sequences. I don't necessarily know what that is, but it's really interesting. <laughs> So then we were able to identify R of RNA, and it has seven reference genomes, and our lowest was with just one Siona sequence falling within it. And with all of this, I wanted to see if this variety of subfamilies was common in gut systems, even with the few that had been identified, or if this was unique to Siona. And what I found was in the human and non-human animal study, only two subfamilies have been identified, the Gakusha RNA, which is that cosmopolitan species, and then the alpha which is in association with the human virome. And within our study, we have seven subfamilies that are seen within this one tiny animal. So with this, again, it has the highest amount of richness seen within the phage family, microviridae, and it comes from an animal the size of my hand with a three inch gut that we're able to dissect. And this just shows how large of a gap of knowledge we have in this family of phage. So we don't necessarily have a good hold on the variety of environments that we find them in because each time a metagenomic study is done in an environment, we have new ones identified. So we need to understand the richness and then put that to the function. So we've identified these in different environments, but we don't necessarily have a good grasp on what they could con be contributing and what they could be doing in these different environments. And this is why I think Siona is an excellent model to look at these dynamics in a gut system. So we have high diversity seen. These animals are easily manipulated in the lab environment. With one petri dish, we can have hundreds of animals and we can easily manipulate them with feeding experiments. So if we're able to identify a novel bacterial host for Gakusha virine and able to isolate the phage, we can put them in a dish and feed them to the animal. Another benefit is that these animals have been able to be reared germ-free. So this is in the absence of bacteria. So we can feed any novel things that we find within this subfamily, an animal that is completely sterile, and then look at the bacterial response, the phage response, and the host to that act of colonization, which you don't necessarily have in a lot of other models. Future aims for this research, which would be to do in a seasonal analysis. So this is just one snapshot in time from the summer. So these animals were collected in California in the summer, and these phage could be changing through those different seasons, but we don't know. They could also be in constant association with, the, with their host, and we don't know that either. So we need to increase what we know from these animals. Characterizing the core virome could also help. So looking at the phage associated with these animals, regardless of where they're found on this planet. So are these microviridae always in association with these animals or does it vary based on the body of water that they filter from? And then assessing the core virome compared to the core microbiome. So are these viruses that are in association with this animal always found with them? And do they closely relate to the microbiome or are they different from one another? And if they're different, they just raise 100 more other questions that this model would be excellent to interpret them. So with that, I would like to thank my family and friends, my amazing boyfriend for always supporting me, my friends for keeping me inspired and humbled and impassioned with everything that I do, and my lab family for always being there for me, always listening to me, always reading a paper when I need it, listening to a presentation, taking late night, late night phone calls, and Nat, Ani, and Kima for your constant support and dedication and your mentorship. Again, my wonderful family and friends and the fellowships that have been able to fund my research from the College of Marine Science and then NSF for funding this grant to do this research.